Hello and welcome to another episode of Climbing on the Bookshelf. Things seem to be picking up momentum a little bit with the show and I've been going for six or seven shows now um, and this show I've managed to chat to a well-known person in the climbing world, well as far as I know in the UK anyway. He's a writer, climber and producer and voice of UK Climbing's Factor 2, a podcast about climbing and outdoor adventure. He's a keen climber, he's on-sited E5 and climbs 7B Sport, so I guess he knows what he's doing. So without me waffling on anymore, I'd like to introduce Will Treasure. Will, welcome to Climbing on the Bookshelf. Hi, no problem. Thanks Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for doing this. It, I really appreciate the time. Firstly, if it's okay with you, I, I asked you to come on the show or you offered uh, to come on the show to talk about climbing books because I guess that's what the show's about. If it's okay with you, I'd like to ask you when and what inspired you to get into the world of climbing to start with. Oh, um, I just I kind of always just wanted to climb. I don't remember a specific moment, but for my 12th birthday, I went to a climbing wall and I really wanted to do that. I guess I'd done a little bit before at school trips or something. And I remember being really gutted that we only got to do one climb um, in some quarry in Wales. And so I was desperate to go back. And there, yeah, I was, uh, there were a few posters on the walls at the climbing wall. And I remember just thinking, yeah, I want to be like those guys. And there was one, there was the famous photo of Doug Scott on the Hillary step yeah. was one of them. And yeah, I didn't, I didn't even know what this world involved though. I had this idea of like, oh, I'll go to big mountains. I'll do these things. I wear really brightly colored clothes and that, yeah, I just knew I, I, I didn't really know anything about it, but I knew I wanted to do it at that yeah. point. Okay, sure. Sounds, sounds similar to me because I, I grew up in the Midlands and I used to go to North Wales and the lakes, which are relatively close from, I used to live in a place called Stafford, which isn't far from. Oh, you've got the roaches just yeah, up the that's road. The one, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. But. I used to go to the Lake District quite a lot and it never really dawned on me to do climbing in those areas. I was always a big hill walker and seeing all these places and wanted to be up there, but dawned on me to, to try it. I've, I have, I have um, an episode in, in a few months back about my climbing story. I think I've climbed a couple of times and I absolutely hated it. I couldn't, I couldn't believe I was crying on the top and all sorts. I was really nervous. Now, maybe the past 10 years or so, I got into reading these books all about it and maybe that was kind of a trigger and it's taken this long for me to to get into this sort of area is that I I don't climb at the moment now not at all I've got a youngish family I suppose knew what climbing was about at all I was I like you I, I just spent time in the mountains and done a bit um like or a party or something like that with cubs or whatever or scouts but never really knew what, what was going on so it took a little while for me to realize what well, that is actually the ultimate thing in the mountains well for me anyway is is to climb them yeah for me i i grew up in the brecon beacons and you know they're like they're so I, I was familiar with being in the mountains but they're rolling hills there's not a lot of climbing in the beacons yeah. and i i didn't really even have this idea as a kid that you could go climbing in the uk all the pictures of the books that i might have been familiar with it was all you know in the himalaya or the alps and so it was something that i'd have to i could do when i was older maybe um, and I guess it represented this sort of freedom to me that I would at some point be old enough to be like, right, I'm going to go and climb Mont Blanc. Or, uh, so, yeah, it was that sort of big kind of becoming an adult freedom that it represented to me. And I guess as I started to actually read climbing books, that's also what it represented in the books that I latched onto. So what, what was the sort of going back to those books, what, what was the first book that you can remember thinking this is it? This is this is this is great. Good question. I don't know what the first climbing book I read was. I had an amazing book um, as a kid, a big picture book about, and it was like this guy who picked up his family in a hot air balloon. It was well, not right. uh, Phileas Fogg, but he, they went okay. on all, all these adventures all over the world and yeah, into sure. different jungles and mountains. And I was really inspired by that. Yeah. And then I guess the first climbing book that had a big influence on me was Hard Rock, which I must have bought when I was about 16. And I was just... I think I'd done a couple of routes outdoors at that point and right. I bought that book and there were loads of routes in there where I was like these are the sort of just about the grades that I, I can imagine doing but all of the descriptions sounded terrifying and the, the you know the black and white photos there's a picture of Pete Crew on Great Wall 
Okay. And it's just yeah. like looking up the face and it's the, just the shadows on the wall. And he's in this position with these sort of bridged out. It looks really tenuous and the ropes around his waist. And I remember just yeah. looking at that and thinking that looks absolutely terrifying. Why, why would uh, you do that? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, my, my instinct at that age, though, I was looking at thinking it looks terrifying. I want to do that I route. Want to... <laughs> I want to experience whatever it is he's going through there. Yeah. And the, just the, yeah. the Ed Drummond's account of that really resonated as a because it's such a uh, to describe it if you've if people have not read it it's kind of a it really gets into the feel of what it's like to be on there and the kind of self-doubt but also the joy and the kind of release of the whole thing and so i that that account of great wall in particular yeah it's almost uh, really quite heroic to do it it you was sort of yeah heroic but foolish at the same time and there was this the balance and <laughs> And Pete Crew was someone that I, I did a bit of reading up on around that time. And I was like, okay. oh, actually, the, the adventures he's had, they sounded amazing. What was, what's the most recent book you've read? Um, I recently read Jim Curran's account of uh, climbing on K2. Um, this, I think it's called yeah. The Story of the Savage Mountain. And it, it yeah. documents every, every attempt over about 100 years. Uh, so from the first explorations, just identifying the peak and then early forays to try and find the base of it and find their way over the passes and then all of the attempts up to about the early 90s to actually okay. climb it sounds a little bit like the ogre by doug scott and so all the history in the first section and how they got there on the glaciers and all that sort of stuff in the olden days like late 1800s i think it was and then his account of what what happened on the way up and the way down and things like that so yeah it sounds but obviously without every single little detail that has gone before him yeah, th this one, I guess, is very much a, a historical thing. And the first, I guess, up until you get to the first ascent, or maybe a little yeah. bit after when there's other things going on, it's yeah. it's quite a good detailed kind of historical narrative. Yeah. And then it reaches a point where expeditions become a bit more widespread and it becomes a bit more like like reading the early chapters of the Bible, where it's <laughs> like, oh, and so it's a big out this, big out that. Uh, there's so much happening that it's quite hard to... Keep a tally. I suppose it leads up to exactly. Jim Curran's first trip there in '86, where they have this big disaster and several people die. Yeah, thing, isn't it? There's always a big disaster somewhere. Does that? I guess Jim's that... whole thesis there is riding on you know which of these people. It's back to that hero and foolhardy yeah. element of who were the people here who actually got unlucky and who just shouldn't have pushed on or what wasn't up to the task. Um, yes. that's quite quick. Yeah. That there's people heading out there who really aren't up to the task chatted very briefly before we came on and i want to ask you about your favorite book now i've heard of it but not seen it there's so many books out there that you can't keep a track of all of them i'm just wondering if you could tell me about it and why it is your favorite yeah it's uh well it's maybe not surprising you haven't seen it because it was out of print for a long time it's yeah. called let's go climbing by colin kirkus which i've just been hunting around for my copy this morning and i can't find it i found oh, no. two other books about him it's written in the 1930s uh, and then Kirkus was killed uh, he was in the RAF during the second world war and he was killed in action so he didn't produce any more output on that and you know it's it stopped a lot of um, really out there first ascents that he was yeah. doing at the time as well yeah. um, but let's go climbing is a bit like scouting for boys it's the whole point of this book is it's like you would pick this up as a 13 year old and particularly as a as a boy um it's it's written in that sort of way where you would think yeah i could do this it's describing you know bits of rope work and adventures that you could have okay. and kind of how to do them in in really simple language and it's very it's very easy to read so you're looking at sort of teenagers i guess it's based at maybe or people who want to start getting into yeah it's it's climbing. uh it's very much aimed at young people who want to get into okay. climbing um and if you picked it up today most of the techniques that he describes are actually really dangerous. It's not okay. it's not a good guidebook from that point of view. There, there is a modern reprint of it, which has a big disclaimer at the front, which says, oh, okay. don't, do it, don't try any of this, or at least not, not any rope techniques. Because uh, at the time he wrote it, they were still using hawser-laid ropes. Uh, there were no climbing harnesses. Yeah. Carabiners were still rudimentary. Sounds like it's my perfect era. I love the sort of pre and post and interwar years of, of climbing. I've read so much of that. It's, it's such it. a different world at that point. It is. Where incredible. Yeah. Even just being, we take it for granted now that we can, oh, you know, if I want to go climbing this afternoon, yeah. I can drive an hour and a half up the road to Dunkeld from Edinburgh and have a great time. You know, at that point, people don't have cars. The roads aren't so good. It's not yeah. 
there's no guidebooks for a lot often, of areas. Often they used to bike to the route. That's exactly what Kirkus did. He lived in Liverpool. He used to cycle out to North Wales on a Friday after work. As you do, you know. And yeah. Cy- Cy- yeah. And then he'd he'd go out to the mountains and do these amazing first ascents and okay. then cycle yeah. home and go back to work as, a, I think, an, as an accountant. I, I, I'm not sure I could imagine myself doing that. It's riding 30, 40 miles, but it's probably more, isn't it, I guess? I think it's about 60, Liverpool, oh, okay. well, Barris. Yeah, and then you've obviously got to ride back as well. Yes. Okay. He, yeah, he must have had a lot, a lot of energy. Um, super, super fit, probably, yeah. He was, uh, oh, is it him and um, Hargreaves used to climb together quite a bit, and they were dubbed the Suicide Squad by some <laughs> of the Climbers Club members. But, and I assume partly because they were climbing really dangerous routes, but also he must have yeah. had kind of a yeah. masochistic streak to be so motivated the whole time. To want to do it after he's just ridden yeah. sixty mile, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Like when when um when Let's Go Climbing was published, he's only in his twenties, so he's still yeah, really young. It must be, I don't know, maybe like nineteen thirty six, thirty seven. It gets published. Okay. It's yeah. just before the war, and yeah, he's so young to have been. I'm actually, I can't imagine being you know, twenty five and thinking, oh, I'm going to write a guide to climbing that people could use. There's a certain arrogance to to that. To I would have been thinking, oh, well, how am I the person to write this book? But the, I guess the whole tone of the book, it's quite. You think actually maybe no one else could have written it quite like this. Okay, do you think that's because of the the kind of language of the writing in those sort of times? It's completely different to to how it is now. Yeah, there's a, an element of that that the language is a bit more formal but because his is aimed at younger people it, it's quite it's quite evocative at points with it's very easy to access the writing so yeah it's formal but it's not formal in the way that uh the sort of expedition reports and expedition books were um it's very much written that if yeah if you were well if you were me as a teenager reading it you would have gone yeah i want to do that and now i feel i can and this guy is describing yeah adventures that i could actually go and have yes yeah there's one that's full on yeah one that i that really caught my imagination was um that i must have read before i owned the book because i remember for a few years thinking where did i read that i want to read more of it and i must have read it as like in part of an essay collection or something and it's where he describes being in the ogwin valley one night in winter and I don't know if he's staying at Ogwin Cottage or possibly down at the um, Helig, the Climbers Club hut. Yeah. He definitely used to stay there quite a bit. And he talks about at about midnight, he goes out into the snow yeah. and there's a full moon. And he decides, oh, I'm, I'm going to go for a walk. So he walks from the Ogwin Valley and goes all the way over the Glidders and down into the, I presume, over to Penna Pass. So the start of Snowdon. And then he goes from Penna Pass all the way up to the top of Snowdon. Then he turns around and he kind of comes all the way back but all in winter conditions and uh, just under the full moon in the middle of the night and he gets back just as dawn is breaking and i'm just reading that and thinking that's it's such a like a freeing adventure to go and do uh and i think i think along the way he talks about he he's sort of running through the boulder fields in the night uh coming down some of these scree slopes in the snow and just hell for leather and just like loving being out in the mountains and it was not it wasn't like he had to set out thinking, right, I've I've been training and I'm going to do a Ramsey round or Which like, did, yes. Yeah, yeah. It was just, oh, the moon's out. It's lovely. I'm going to go for a, for a wander. Go for a I'm wander, just, yes. It just happens I'm going to do this amazing day out, well, day, yeah. night out. Yeah, I, I just loved that as a, it was a kind of silly adventure to do that would be really memorable, that you'd you'd really get something from doing some, yeah. a, a trip like that. Yeah, not done something recently, but it's a similar sort of thing. I used to go up to the lakes with a friend of mine who now lives in Canada. He's quite, he lives in Calgary and stuff. Uh, I think it's the Canadian Rockies, which are pretty close to there. But I used to drive from Stafford. I used to drive up on a Friday night up to the Lake District. And then it was only walking, wasn't no climbing involved, kind of climbing, scrambling. We'd drive up to the Langdales and we'd go up Jack's Rake past Stickletarn and up, up to the top, back down again in one go, and then we'd drive back home. And <laughs> sometimes it was there were, it was January, February time, and there was snow all around, and but other times it was pouring with rain, and you know it was the daytime, and sometimes it was at night. But so I guess that's that's where I've got my interest from, and it's only kind of come into the fore now where I've started to get interested and think, well, why didn't I just carry on doing it? Because this was <laughs> very early nineties. 
So I would have been, you know, I would have had sort of 30 years experience by now if I'd have started then. You know, there's just sort of little adventures like that just kind of just kept me going. It was great. It was really good. Yeah, I think those kind of adventures are, especially when you're when you're young, there's something yeah. really valuable about getting to know these places and yeah. and feeling, I guess, it, if you've been to them quite a few times, I really felt a sort of sense of ownership over some of them. Um, I used to go up when I, when I started at university. I, I was in Nottingham, and I used to get the train up to the Peak District quite a lot. And I guess I'd met climbers in Nottingham, but I'm quite shy and I was sort of still getting to know people, so I didn't like to impose. So I'd get the train up and yeah. I'd maybe meet some friends or just go out on my own. And I might do that after lectures on a Friday, and then I'd sleep out in Robin Hood's cave, and then right. I'd go and soloing routes along Stanage on the Saturday and read my book for a bit and maybe I'd bump into some people I knew and rope up to do some routes. I remember coming back to Nottingham one Sunday evening and my f- friends at university said, oh, where, where have you been? And I said, oh, I've been, you know, and I said, oh, I've been up here and they were, oh, where were you staying? I said, oh, I was sleeping in this cave and this just sounds insane. They were... It's a um, sort of sense that you'd done it. Yeah, they, I mean, they were not outdoorsy people particularly and the idea that, I guess they, they thought, but didn't anyone mind? Well, you know, I had I'd had one day where one of the rangers had come round and at about half past seven in the morning, but he just gave me a wave and carried on. And it was interesting that to them, this was so unfamiliar. Yeah. But by this point, I'd already been out in the mountains enough to feel a bit like, well, no, even if someone shows up and tells me to not not to sleep there, I'm, I'm probably going to tell them to get lost if it's somewhat, you know, if it's not their back garden. Uh, and. Yeah, just kind of reveling in actually exploring all of these places was was really valuable. Your podcast and one of your episodes recently, I think it was sort of uh, it was called "A Play for Voices," where you had a chat with Helen Mort and Anna Fleming. I've I've re-listened to it this week about um, women in climbing literature. Is that there's very few. I've I from listening to that episode, I was, I was thinking back the thing that the things that I've read. Um, and thinking, actually, yeah, that they're, they're right. There's why I don't, I, I can't get my head round why there isn't. Um, I've read a few books where uh, first on the rope is one of them by Roger Frijon Roche. Um, mm-hmm. Is that there's a girl in it, but she's kind of glossed over. She can climb, but generally she's at her house or the the hotel or something like that. It's it, that you know that she can climb, but it's it's not really mentioned. It almost is. It's almost true to, to to mention it, but it just wasn't there at all. There was another one as well. I think it might be some guys go climbing with a, with a girl and they get stuck and they get stuck on a face um, in a storm and she gets hit by lightning but survives. Um, and there's a picture of her in the book and it, it was someone to do. It might have been with Gaston. I can't remember what his surname is. Rebbe Fat. Uh, Rebbe Fat. Yeah. That's him. Yeah. And that was that, the story just moved on very quickly. So I don't quite know why why there's not very female main characters, if that if that makes yeah. sense. Other than the latest one by um, Elizabeth Revolt, who I've just uh, what I've just read mm. as well. And that's probably about it. That all I can remember. But I don't know if you know of any other climbers that are mentioned at all. It's interesting. There's a, a sort of mm-hmm. I guess I have my own theories on some of this some of it i think is that like uh public art like writing books and owning that is um is i guess historically a bigger risk for women than it is for men a lot of those earlier books are written by the men leading the expeditions and their own you know if if they were a woman trying to lead that expedition they'd probably been laughed at and not not able to get funding and yes yes um but but all of those there are women you know 150 and even more years ago who are doing these ascents there's uh, helen mort talks in one of her books about i can't remember the route it's um in the alps somewhere chamonix i think where there's a first ascent done by two women and it's kind of ridiculed and lampooned as this uh ridiculous thing but it's quite a hard route and there was yeah, I guess quite a lot of kind of egocentric sexism going yep. on in in some yeah. of these circles, unfortunately. And, they, you know, there's all things about access, but there's there are lots of very good female writers and 
Uh, Gwen Moffat, uh, Space Beneath My Feet. That's very good. Uh, Gwen was the first female British mountain guide. 1950s. She... There was a documentary about her, oh, I think. There's a very good um, Operation Moffat. That's the one, yes. It's a very good film yeah. with uh, uh, what's what name Jen, is. Um, Jen Randall and yes. the girl from Kendall. I can't remember her name. Yeah, no, I can't remember. No. That's uh, off the top of my head. But yeah, that was a really good, I think it won an award there as well. I suppose a little like that embodies the Kirkus book we were talking about. That's yeah. the same kind of spirit of adventure captured in there. And like a lot of Gwen did a lot of climbing barefoot. And she just loved being out in the mountains. And she writes, she's written about climbing, but she's written novels as well. So she's actually a really solid writer. Like we were saying earlier, I think sometimes we give a lot of benefit of the doubt to something that's a good story, even if it's not actually as tight. And I'm hypercritical of these things. <laughs> um, but I feel like there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of climbing stories out there that could have done with a slightly more ruthless edit. Uh, yeah. And I think Gwen Moffat, yeah. Is is someone who who doesn't need that? I try to think who else because a lot of the modern female climbing writers, it's it's a bit more kind of nature writing, I suppose. Not you know historically, a lot of climbing writing is is like men operating at the top of their game, or at least trying to create the impression that they're operating at the top of their game. And yeah. the women writing about climbing now, and you think people like Helen Morton, Anna, and Heather Dorr, uh Yes, yes. Where it's not someone who who's trying to write and say, look what a big deal I am. It's like, here's an experience I had that's really powerful to me and I'd like to share it with you. It's kind of coming from a different place. Do you think that they write for women or do you think that they, they're trying to have their voice heard? Mostly the latter, but uh, Helen Mort has certainly written a few things that are directly addressing that issue of women okay. in in the mountains yes. um her book of poetry has quite a few uh what's it called they, they have no map to lead them or um but yeah there's quite a few directly addressing that issue of women in the mountains and women being written about in the mountains yeah. whereas i spoke to anna partly because she had an essay in waymaking which uh vertebrate published a few years ago it's a okay. collection of yeah. art and women's writing about okay. the mountains yeah, there is still that. I, I wonder as well, to some extent, whether there's still that gap, because actually people publish in lots of different ways now. Like you know, they make videos or podcasts, or uh, yeah. they're not necessarily writing books or magazine pieces no. because there's other options. With the Olympics coming up, and with the increased popularity in climbing, um, it seems to be taking off quite a bit now. Do you think that uh, more non-climbers will get outside and start climbing um but i'm wondering if this would have a bit of a knock-on effect on like the local crag or the wall um and it'll be a bit busier but for the people that want to have that kind of solitude and getaway do you think they'll pick up more mountain books that's a good question um i think my experience i've been climbing since the late 90s yeah. and climbing walls have evolved a lot in that time they were still they were still really populated by climbers when I started. Mm -hmm. uh, over time, so when did the I lived in Nottingham when the uh, the climbing works opened in Sheffield, and I remember okay. thinking, "What? Just a bouldering wall? That's mad! Why would you only want to go to a bouldering wall?" And of course, it's amazing. But also, those things are so much more accessible for people. Uh, you don't have to be a climber. You don't have to learn anything about ropes if you don't want to. You don't have to necessarily want to overcome any fear. Although saying that a lot of bouldering walls are quite high. When you start out, I think it's probably quite intimidating still because you've got to get yourself down. But I th what I'm seeing more and more now is you. I, I went to the wall in Edinburgh yesterday, Alien Block, and there's loads of people where this is just an alternative to the gym. You know, and I totally get that. I don't. I find the gym quite a sedate environment, whereas climbing feels a bit more kind of holistic it's a bit more interesting with problem solving and so it's a, i think it's a really good alternative for that and then i guess there's there's a lot of people in that position and i suppose the fear in the climbing world is that then they those people want to go outside which is great but they're only initially going to go to the really accessible places and that means you're probably bouldering and sport climbing and then those places there's not many of them in the uk so you start to get busy and busy actually the the slightly less inaccessible places i don't think have got any busier at all 
Um, but I don't think that folklore uh, about those places to make you want to go there, I don't think that's really a part of the scene that those new people into climbing see. I'm not sure that the books are are that prominent or accessible to them, whereas social media, YouTube, yeah. those sorts of things are a bit more. Yeah, I see that. yeah there's always a, an issue as well, though, that you, and I certainly had this with early climbing books that I read, that they just put the fear into me sometimes. Ah. Where, and then yeah. I remember a few routes that I'd built up in my head thinking, oh, this would be such a big deal. And then I went and did them and just like, oh, no, hang on. It, it, it was fine. It was just a little bit harder than the last one. And maybe, you know, we got a bit scared, but... I think making, making them out to be a bit more um, dangerous than they were just because it sounds good in the book. Yeah, and maybe that does describe the experience that person had, but I feel like, yeah, there were a lot of them where you go out and think, actually, no, it just took a bit of planning and organisation in it yeah. and, and having a go. And you can be put off by reading these fantastic stories of, you know, daring do without realising, actually, there's there's quite a bit of knowledge to gain here, but you fundamentally most of these things are pretty accessible but also in climbing i guess the the thing that's really good is when you get out like living in scotland at the moment it's amazing you can get out into the hills and there's yeah. all these adventures to have and it doesn't matter if you want to climb e5 or v diff you yeah. can still have kind of a similar scale of adventure on your own terms yeah i don't know if those people will, will necessarily pick up a book and i'm not sure what book would, they would pick up that would inspire them yeah, because there, like, there, there aren't any books there that, well, you don't hear of books, stories about sport climbs or bouldering books. You know, that's probably the books of the you know guide to bouldering or something they'll probably pick up, I guess. Yeah, I suppose the field looks quite different now. And you think, actually, if you're going to pick up a book about sport climbing or bouldering, it's more likely to be a, a kind of sporting excellence. How, how are you going to get better at this? Yeah, I, I think that's something that, talking with Helen and Anna for that episode that I hadn't really appreciated before that actually mastery is really important uh it makes me yeah. feel really good and I hadn't really understood that actually that's not the case for everyone um lots of people just want to feel competent and safe they're not actually worried about stepping beyond that into feeling a sort of bigger level of control they just want to go out and enjoy themselves and in my case those two things are very much interlinked like i i enjoy myself the most when i really feel that i've mastered something i i love that the movement when you're climbing i particularly love when you especially when you're a little bit scared and you execute something perfectly and just yeah. think yeah i've i nailed that and i feel so good about that that kind of control yeah, and it is control, and it's control in in lots of different ways for me. That you know, control over different outcomes as well as the choice of what I'm doing. Whereas I think for for Helen and Anna, when I was talking to them, I felt like actually yeah. I don't think that mastery element is that's not as important as other parts of the experience for you. And maybe a yeah. So if you're coming out into into the sport climbing, those those books are really aimed at that mastery. I'm going to practice these techniques. I'm going to yeah. rather than actually, I'm going to go and have these adventures and experiences which is i guess those are the bits that social media captures very quickly a sort of essence of oh here's a beautiful place or and maybe it captures that imagination element more than more than you can in a how-to book well that was amazing thank you so much will he really does know his stuff in both climbing literature and actual climbing i'm so pleased to have spoken to him and really appreciated him giving me some of his time. I know that he's busy with his own projects and especially his UK Climbing Podcast Factor 2. I've put a link in the show notes so you can have a look and listen to what he does. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode and you now feel the urge to go and buy some of your own mountain literature. Thanks for listening and downloading this episode of Climbing on the Bookshelf. (laughs) 